let's switch gears now and talk a bit more about the technology. I'd love to hear about uh, new products that are coming out of Caterpillar. I had a, a note for a hybrid hybrid drive bulldozer amongst mm -hmm. other products. Can mm -hmm. you give us some a, a sneak preview? Yeah, so well, at the, um, the drive bulldozer you're talking about is an electric drive and that's a D7E that I was talking about. But basically the engine that, that runs powers a um, electric power generation and then motors, electric motors, turn those, uh, turn the track and make that go around and around. We're also using uh, various energy recovery mechanisms and one of the things that so makes being an engineer at Caterpillar so fun, um, proving that nerdiness over and over again, <laughs> uh, is that each of our machines has a different kind of emission. Mm -hmm. uh, emission, so the track type tractor goes forward and it makes great sense, design sense, uh, to, to use those electric motors and to help reduce the energy consumption. Uh, we also have other machines that have different kind of missions. Some go back and forth and, you know, wheel loaders and grab buckets. And we're looking at technologies to recover that energy uh, when we do swinging and move those machines back and forth. And, and there's a, quite a bit of technology uh, coming out. And in fact, you'll probably see some things come out this fall yet uh, from Caterpillar in that regard. There'll be some announcements in, uh, at Mine Expo, which is going to be this fall. And then we're going to have the trade press to Peoria in October, you'll see more announcements then. So what, what's the future look like for clean diesel? I mean, we're almost at near zero. Uh, what, what are the kind of short-term goals and, and long-term ones? You know, I guess I'd, I'll chime in. First of all, I, I echo um, Vicky's interest in having more retrofit capabilities. I'd like to see, uh, see that come. Uh, more or lower emission standards in some of the developing countries mm -hmm. uh, so that we can leverage that. So it's kind of get, you know, how can we spread the value that we've already developed? And then what's really the next on the horizon, and that's reducing the fuel consumption, which Vicki had already, re already talked about. What can we do to reduce fuel consumption? And then greenhouse gas uh, and natural, by using natural gas and improving that fuel consumption, and I agree with what you said. I mean, as we get that natural gas out of the ground, it surely has to be in a safe way. One of the things we've learned from um, the experience we've had in working on these issues is that, you know, I'm, I'm an attorney, so, you know, you know, we focus on kind of putting words on paper and uh, we think, wow, you know, we set these standards out and, you know, magically sort of, you know, pollution gets reduced from the air. And, and, and um, in working with um, companies like Caterpillar and some of the other big diesel um, engine makers, it is um, an enormous amount of leadership and engineering that goes into sort of taking the words on paper um, and translating that to pollution out of the air. And it couldn't happen without people who are incredibly dedicated, who work very, very hard, and are determined uh, to achieve these societal goals. And, and we do have some big challenges. And, and the next big challenge, of course, is how do we sort of both um, address the sort of legacy fleet and complete our work here at home and then uh, work in other parts of the world in partnership to uh, both uh, protect human health and address uh, a changing climate. Some big challenges, but a strong foundation to build from. Excellent. Well, I'd now like to open it up to the audience for questions, and this seems cute. Um, I think someone is coming around with a microphone. You know what? I know that lady in the red top needs to, uh, oh, sorry, she's just in front of you, needs to get a plane, so <laughs> why don't you go first? Yes, I work for the National Biodiesel Board, and I was hoping that you might talk a little bit about Caterpillar's positive stance on biodiesel and, and some of the benefits associated with that. Yeah, so biodiesel uh, is part of the solution as well, and it, that you know, natural gas is such a hot topic right now, I didn't mention that. Uh, but we are doing uh, quite a bit of research in the alternative fuels, including biodiesel, and how can we mix especially second generation biofuels with diesel fuel to be able to, with very little engine modification, uh, you know, burn those, kinds of, burn those kinds of fuels, and that's helpful for the environment as well. Tomorrow, another lady at the front here. We can burn up today 20% replacement of uh, conventional diesel fuel with a, with a biofuel. Um, that was one of my questions, because I do think that uh, moving to a more sustainable feedstock which biodiesel is a solution for, rather than relying on a fossil-based diesel fuel, is ultimately where we have to get to. But I also had a question 
uh, with the retrofit programs. At this point, are they all pretty much voluntary? And, or is there some kind of deadline where you know, some of these uh, companies maybe that do have these older legacy vehicles where they are going to be obligated to get rid of them because there are some people who probably, I mean, I know education is important, but there's some companies probably who are not going to get rid of these uh, vehicles or bother to get them retrofitted unless they're forced to. So I'm wondering if that if there's anything like that in place right now. Yeah. I'll make a comment and then you can follow up. I mean, there are, it, it varies widely by geographic region. And in some regions, say here in, in California, there's something called fleet averaging rules, which requires that a, that a uh, company that's running a f construction equipment <laughs> will have to have a certain average level of emissions from his fleet and that gets, that gets ratcheted tighter and tighter and tighter over years. It doesn't stipulate how he does that, whether it's through retrofit or whether it's through uh, selling the equipment into another region and then buying new. It doesn't really stipulate how, but there are, it, there are some, I guess you'd say, forcing mechanisms in different, uh, in different regions. I, I still, though, remain an advocate of trying to find the and in all of this um, and finding a way to help those customers get more productive in a way that is more economical and also uh, more sustainable for the environment. Um, there are few um, examples I can think of beyond those that Hannah mentioned that sort of provide kind of a legally enforceable deadline by which um, engines have to be phased out. There have been some very um, important um, efforts locally um, and, and communities across the country to really drive a, a, a transition. And so, for example, here in the Port of Los Angeles, under the leadership of um, uh, the harbor commissioners and community activists who've raised a lot of concerns about the diesel pollution associated with the port. The port is well on its way to dramatically reducing uh, particulates and other harmful pollutants um, by over 70 percent. And they set some ambitious goals and they're doing it through a number of technologies and best management practices. But, um, and those are, those are important in their own right in delivering you know, cleaner, healthier air to that community. They also become models for the rest of the country to try to sort of draw from but uh, there's an enormous amount of work that still needs to be done in addressing kind of the health and environmental burden of the legacy fleet, um, and, and so that, that's important. There's also, on the, on the fuels piece, um, California has really led the way in adopting a low-carbon fuel standard, um, and uh, there's been a lot of concern just recently um, in uh, the wake of the nation's sort of renewable fuels mandates and the implications that that's had for food prices and food security. And one of the benefits of the California low carbon fuel standard is it's not a volumetric mandate, it's a performance standard. And it says, you know, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a greenhouse gas emissions performance standard and we're gonna let sort of all of the fuels compete in the marketplace to meet that performance standard. So it really um, provides sort of a, a really compelling and elegant basis for spurring uh, these kinds of transformations. And it's one of the um, only one of its kinds in our country. There are other states that are looking at it now. Oregon has a clean fuel standard it uh, has under development. There are some states in the, in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic that are looking at these issues. But, um, you know, it's really important that California's leadership sort of help provide the breakthroughs and that we all do what we can to support that. I just wanted to thank the speakers for a tremendous presentation. I'm with the Technology Advancement Office at the Air Quality Management District and the uh, program has been in place for about 20 years, providing funding. Um, we have a lot of information at our booth. I welcome you to come by. We have information on fleets and funding opportunities. Also, just wanted to quickly mention the challenge that we have here in our region is very much going to be related to uh, particulate matter pollution and ultrafine particles. That really is a challenge for our region now. We're working on our air quality management plan. There's going to be a series of hearings coming up in September. We have copies of the plan available on CD if you like copies. And just want to thank everyone for um, tremendous information resource um, here today. Thank you. Um, I just want to really quickly go back to the biodiesel discussion. I just had a question um, mostly for a Caterpillar, but um, either one. Uh, is there any sort of, I have friends and in my community a lot of people have been taking kind of especially like old Mercedes and um, put like doing the 
the kit or whatever so that they can have biodiesel cars. And so it's worked really well for just kind of personal vehicles. And I'm wondering if there's any sort of kind of compromise in terms of ability that you have to make in ter um, if you want to do full biodiesel on the industrial scale. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, currently we, you can burn up to 20 percent biofuel today. Uh, and we're doing research right now on what would it take to modify an engine to make it burn up with 100 percent biodiesel. I sat down at lunch here recently with a bunch of our research engineers just for my own amusement. Uh, and the lunch was kind of quiet because engineers can be kind of introverted and I freaked them out when I sat down next to them. But anyway, so one way to try to get them to talk was to ask them what their hobbies uh, were. And one of the young gentlemen whom I tried to uh, get my daughter interested in, but it didn't work. Um, she's marrying an accountant instead. Anyway, uh, his hobby was taking his uh, Volkswagen TDI with the TDI engine and a diesel and uh, burning french fry oil in it and you know we've got folks that, that work on that that kind of thing every day and there is there's quite a bit of opportunity but there's you have to modify if you give much higher than 20 or 30 percent you have to start modifying the engine design otherwise you're going to have problems with say life oil change intervals uh, it's not going to have the same power density so when you put your foot in the throttle which you know i don't know about you guys i'd love to do that but to put your foot in the throttle and you know power up the hill it might not have that performance so you know we're looking for that's why we're looking at engine design um, characteristics what do we need to do there in order to give it that diesel feel but with the less dense fuel apart from the engine modifications is there a big price discrepancy in the price of fuel diesel compared with biodiesel fuel uh, I if I remember my math right in this, we have this person right here. She can probably answer that question. Yeah, it, the answer is it depends. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it really is kind of like buying a house. It depends on what part of the country. And um, there was a, a tax incentive for biodiesel that is, has, was not renewed, so that's made an impact. But at the same time, other policies are helping making it more competitive. Mm -hmm. So the answer is anywhere from a little bit cheaper to as much as a dollar anywhere from a little bit cheaper to as much as a dollar per gallon more, depending on where you are and what's going on. Got it, thank you. How handy that you ask a question early. <laughs> thank you for the collaborative approach that you've obviously taken in um, bringing these sort of divisive issues together and finding solutions. My question is, to what do you attribute the success of that approach in tackling the, these issues from the EDF perspective and Caterpillar's perspective? And how can we translate that into achieving success in energy independence and you know, other renewable energy initiatives that um, have somehow been linked in the media to job killing X um, or mm -hmm. job killing Y when clearly it seems, based on the examples that we've seen from other countries like Germany, you can actually create jobs and have a more resilient economy when you embrace the change rather than try to oppose it. You go ahead. You see a broader array of industries than I do, Vicki. Well, I think first and foremost, leadership matters, right? Um, the people are in this room who are trying to sort of innovate new clean <coughs> technologies, the people who are providing policy leadership. Um, it just it matters enormously, and um, it just makes a big, big difference. And um, you know, the country has found itself um, in this place where we've kind of lost our way a little bit on some of these kind of core American values. Um, my father, um, you know, he um, grew up on a, on a ranch in a, in a small town in New Mexico. He told us that he graduated in the top uh, 10 of his class. And then when we finally visited the small town where we grew up, we realized there were 13 in his, high, in his senior <laughs> class. So, it, you know, and he would tell you that clean air and clean water is a core American mm -hmm. value. And somehow we have become sort of so polarized and so divided. And, you know, we were not that way. When uh, the Clean Air Act amendments, um, you know, passed, uh, for the, really for the first time, the modern Clean Air Act in 1970, there were some um, predecessor laws, but in 1970, it passed the United States Senate unanimously. 
Uh, Rupert, you know, there's a senator named John Sherman uh, Cooper in Kentucky, Republican from Kentucky, who said, you know, we debated, we struggled, but ultimately we worked together and we found a path forward because we believed we had a way to address the problem of air pollution in our nation. In 1990, um, the Clean Air Act amendments of an overhaul, a sweeping overhaul of that law, you know, it passed the United States Senate 89 to 10. 401 to 25 in the House of Representatives, signed into law by President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. You know, this has long been kind of a core kind of shared American value. One of the things that uh, we have been doing at Environmental Defense Fund is in, in addition to trying to find the companies and the industries that are willing to lead and that we can sort of engage with um, in, in making sort of real, you know, world pillars of progress, um, like Caterpillar, we've also been trying to sort of reclaim that lost ground. And uh, there's a project uh, we have called Moms Clean Air Force. We started it about a year ago, and it has taken off unlike anything we've ever been involved with. There are over 100,000 moms who are members, and they are military moms, they are Latina moms, they are Christian conservative moms, and they are united by an abiding commitment to cleaner, healthier air for their kids. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it turns, it reminds us all, like what is this really all about? Right? And we have these shared core American values. We all have these hopes and dreams when we put our children to bed at night. And that is a hope and dream that our child can live in a safe, secure, healthy environment. And it's not just our children, but it's all, you know, all children. And, and we are trying to do our small part you know, through the voices of moms. And it is remarkable. These moms are sort of roaring. And they're saying we do have these shared American values. And there are people like Julianne Moore who have done videos to sort of unite moms. We have Muhammad Ali's daughter who's done some videos for us and you know, join the Moms Clean Air Force and help us kind of reclaim kind of this, 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 these shared American values and remind our policymakers and our politicians that these are things that we all care about deeply and we're determined to work together to solve. Thank you, Vicky. Was that Moms Clean Air Force? Moms Clean Air Force. Okay. Uh, .org. Dot org. All the moms out there. More questions? I'm Maggie Phillips from the Grazie Dio School at Pepperdine. Um, I'm a professor of international business, and my students are all, always uh, concerned about uh, how they can contribute to the policy and technology collaboration that's going on. Is it too early, I guess my primary question is, is it too early for organizations to begin to include in their sustainability requirements for their supply chain, uh, uh, for example, requirements about the, the use of uh, uh, transportation distribution processes that are uh, diesel-based and clean diesel-based and so on. What is it, what are the ways that uh, those of us, especially colleagues in this room who, who have small businesses uh, not involved in the policy side or the technology side, could be a force for um, this collaboration. So I'm going to make a business comment, and then I'm going to turn it over to Vicki. And again, I'm going to go back to our previous most amusing speaker. And you know, she talked about uh, waste, and waste is money. You know, this is good business. Finding a way to to win with sustainability is good for business, and it it helps you to be more profitable. If you're, if you're doing it properly. And our challenge in industry is to find a way to make more money with this and to remember the guy, you know, not get so caught up in any of it uh, or any idealism that we remember the guy who's paying the green dollars, you know, for his product. And how do we help him find a win? We certainly have the power to put expectations on our supply chain and we have ga gained some good ideas from EDF who has some really good experience in putting some pressure on the supply chain and working with them. You know, we've done some benchmarking with them and looking at some of those things. But I guess I'd go back, if I was trying to influence a young mind, I would get them to try to embrace, um, to, you know, Vicki's point, some common vision, and then understand different perspectives from the different stakeholders and realize that it's their role, whether they're in you know, government, a regulatory agency, or whether they're in industry, you know, to see, be able to see the world through those multiple lenses and find the win in there. Uh, Environmental Defense Fund, we have a program called Climate Corps. Um, and it started out just a few years ago with this kind of nascent idea of, can you kind of partner with business schools and business students and place them in large companies 
and turn them loose for summer and let them kind of find those opportunities, those win-win convergences where we can reduce pollution and save money. We all know they're there, but harvesting them and rooting them out is, is a big part of the challenge. Um, this past summer, uh, we just wrapped up um, the Climate Corps uh, effort. There were over 100 um, MBA students placed in uh, major private companies across the country, and increasingly, we're also place, placing them in the public sector, places like the New York Housing Authority. And it's um, an incredible sort of uh, virtuous cycle in that uh, you have these bright, young uh, business students who work with companies like Caterpillar and say, okay, we want to work with you to find ways to harvest out these, uh, you know, root out these inefficiencies, um, save money, reduce pollution, and, uh, and we're gonna determined to sort of follow through on that. And then we're going to sort of then, you know, continue our career in business, you know, really in a way that where they forged this experience uh, working kind of at the cutting edge of sustainability. Um, it's been incredibly successful. We have an enormous amount of interest in the program and, you know, would love to partner with, you know, any or all of you in, in trying to sort of make it more successful and, and sending out these uh, leaders in the business community who are kind of anchored in this important real world experience and trying to sort of figure out sustainability in the most kind of practical way. One of those this summer was actually Caterpillar with a student from MIT and then participating in this program. Excellent. <clears throat> well, on that note, we're going to leave it there, ladies. Uh, thank you so much, Tana and Vicky, for your contribution and thank time you. today. And thank you for the audience for your excellent questions.